A while back, I bought this because I really wanted to know what was inside and I remember at the time it was quite expensive and the price has gone up a bit recently. It's, it's about, starts about £30, goes up, up to unlimited thanks to the current global situation. Um, but I decided I'm going to buy it and I'm going to take it to bits and then it arrived and I was like, oh, do I really want to take that to bits? It's been quite pricey and now I think it is time to take it to bits because it is very relevant to the current health situation that's happening in the world. So this is a Corona Discharge Ozone Generator and it's got an air inlet and an air outlet. I'm not sure if they're designated one as an inlet, one as an outlet um, or if it's just uh, either way, they're not marked anyway. But as air flows in, it flows around the inside this tube and comes out here and it comes out with a very high concentration of ozone. And to achieve that, it uses a high voltage power supply. So this is metal. Being one of the electrodes here is unknown state. You wouldn't want to touch this while it was powered. I will power this up before I take it to bits, um, but you're not going to see much. You're going to hear something probably. Will we power it up right now? Let's power it up right now. We'll bring the hop in and we'll see what this looks like. So I shall twist the wires and I shall stick them into the hoppy. That's that's good for something high voltage. Note there is no ground on this. It's just uh, live and neutral. So I'll plug those in here. And when I plug this in, I'm kind of expecting a fizzing, hissing noise. I'm not going to touch these wires because that will be high voltage. I can hear arcane sparking. It says 12 watts. That's more arcier than I was expecting. Is this going to be safe to touch? Uh, yes, it is, because I already measured the resistance across that. And it was about 600 ohms. It's not showing any heat. OK. Uh, let me remind myself. What was the... that? I said that was about 16 watts. Was it... Was it? Oh, hold on, I'm going to do it again. Uh, 12 watts. Power factor is terrible. Uh, 290 milliamps. Okay. Radio, now we've done that test. Let's talk about the process of creating the ozone. That is quite noisy. I saw the bar graph peak in there. That's going to really mess up the audio. So here's the principle of ozone. Let's uh, focus down onto this level here. The principle of ozone is this. If you have two electrodes, particularly the corona uh, discharge method creating ozone. If you have two electrodes and you pass a high voltage between them, I've covered this before, so my apologies if you're getting deja vu, but if you pass a high voltage between them, a spark will jump between them and it'll make a loud fizzing, cracking, popping noise. And uh, as air flows through that, it will get exposed to some of that arc, but it's very inefficient. It'll be giving off lots of heat. It'll be burning up these electrodes quickly. So what they do instead is they have the same two electrodes, but they put a spacer between them, an insulator, a dielectric. And that could be right up against one of the electrodes, or it could be right in the middle between the two of them. So let's just put it in between two of them. It could be glass, it could be ceramic. Ceramic is a really good choice. It's a better choice than glass because it's got a much uh, higher dielectric strength. Now, because the voltage wants to jump across, it capacitively couples because it's AC. So currents want to flow backwards and forwards, but it can't arc across. So it creates lots and lots of fine sparks instead that sort of fan out from the electrodes. And they are visible as a purple corona discharge. And as the air flows through them, the molecules of oxygen air, and a molecule of oxygen is two atoms of oxygen, O2, connected together. That is oxygen in its most stable form. They get split apart by that um, energy in that corona discharge into separate ozo uh, oxygen molecules. And some of those combine with other existing O2 to make O3, and O3 is ozone. It's not super efficient, but it doesn't take much ozone to have a profound effect. So... The idea of this one is that I'm guessing that inside is this outer tube, which is one electrode. There's going to be, probably quite close to the uh, the side here, there's going to be an insulator tube, probably glass. And then inside that one, then is going to be some form of electrode. And uh, it's probably just going to be a spiral of wire. It might be a piece of mesh. I don't know. I've not opened it yet. This is why we're making this video. And the air flows in here and out here. And in doing so, when this is powered up, there's the insulator and the inner electrode. There's the outer electrode, which this is soldered direct onto. And you get a corona discharge forms between the wall of the uh, 
tube, the inside wall. And the air flows round and spirals round that and then comes out here and that's the ozonated. And the ozone, ozonated air can then be bubbled through water and it imparts the ozone molecules into the water and has a strong sterilising effect. Or the air can just be blown into the room. This came with the wires not connected. It came with a blob of solder in this. And uh, I'm just going to focus, I'm just going to focus, uh, hold on, let's bring this back in. Let's focus up at a better height. Pow. We're now focused at a better height. Um, so uh, this came with a solder blob on the side and some fairly aggressive looking flux around it. And I guess that was just to make it easier to solder the wire on because if this is stainless steel, have I got a magnet? I reckon it's stainless steel. That makes sense because ordinary steel, materials like steel and rubber and plastic will be damaged by ozone. So if this was just ordinary steel, it would corrode very quickly. So the stainless steel, they've put this solder on just to make it easier for you to flow the solder on yourself when you connect the wire. And it was. It was very easy. I just used this standard iron to put it on. Likewise, there's a tab for the middle electrode at the other end here and a very sharp wire sticking out the end which might be a clue. That's the wire that's leading to the inner electrode. The power supply. I'm perplexed by the power supply. Look at the size of it. This is the equivalent neon power supply. It puts out about three volts, uh, three kilovolts, should I say. Uh, big difference. Um, but it's tiny. I wonder if you could use this in the place of that one. I'm not really sure. Or if the neon power supply might get miffed. Let's take this metal plate off the bottom and see if there's anything visible inside or if it's potted up to the hilt with resin. There is some circuitry visible. There are some big capacitors. There's a bridge rectifier. I noticed a strong buzzing there. I'm guessing... Is this a com mode suppression choke? I think it is. Maybe to reduce the electrical noise. I'm guessing... And I could be wrong, because this is kind of potted in resin here. I'm guessing these capacitors are charged and then discharged forcibly by this component here, which could be a triac or thyristor. Is it visible? What it is? No, it's covered in resin. Well, that's quite annoying. Um, and the high voltage transformer here, probably with a fairly coarse primary and a uh, very high number of turns of secretary, and I can see sort of little layers here that could possibly be multiple sections of windings. It might only occupy a tiny part of this uh, resin potted area, but that will be the high voltage transformer. Then it is just straight. The secondary is just going straight out to this tube because I measured it at six hundred ohms. Um, right. So we're taking that apart. The tube is what we want to take apart, and I'm not sure how I'm going to be able, able to open this. I may have to pause because I'm going to be either I'll, I'll try heat on this. I don't think maybe I could squeeze it and maybe it would crack the resin. Give me a sound. I'm just going to grab a pair of. Uh, grips. Here we go. Suitable crushing devices. Let's crush it and see what happens. Is it? Gonna... Oh, it's promising. It's making crunchy noises. Not necessarily good crunchy noises. It is decent crunchy noises because everything's flexible and that. Yeah, the resin is uh, kind of cracking there. Is there anything else cracking is the question. Oh, that was it. Oh, it's a glass tube inside. It's a sealed glass tube. Oh, that's interesting. Right, tell you what, I think we need the other end off now. So I shall give it the same treatment at this end. Squeaky, squeaky. Hopefully not crushing the glass tube in the process. This is not giving up as easily. I'll keep squeezing around it. My apologies to the squeaky noises. Is that it? Oh, that feels that feels kind of promising. Oh, get out! I'm not having any joy here. Uh, oh no, it is moving. It is moving. I'm just going to have to be a bit more persistent with it. I would pause at this point in time, but then you miss the reveal. Oh, get off. Uh, this is not... 
This is not happening. Oh, there it goes. There it goes. What do we have? I'm wondering, is the end of this tube open? Or is that got a gas discharge inside? No, it can't be. It looks as though it's made like a conventional lamp. I want to kind of get rid of this resin here, but I don't want to break the tube. Some of these systems use... Oh, actually, you know, that's soldered. Soldering iron on. Is this kind of semi... Right, I think I can, uh, I think I can get this out if I desolder that. Just bear with me while the solder iron heats up. Some of the tubes use a gas inside, um, and that gas helps couple the current to the inside wall. But in this instance, it does look like it's sealed with a... Uh, it's got this mesh inside it, this stainless steel mesh. Why has it been heated at the end? I did notice a crackling noise. I'm not sure what the crackling was. The temptation is to hook this up again. Just put it in the vicinity and see what happens. Should we do that? Yes, we should. Yes, we absolutely should. That's a terrible idea. In fact, you know what? I may actually just wrap a wire around the outside so we can see it in more detail. Um, and we'll see what happens. And I'll do that before I desolder this in. Right, tell you what, let's get a bit of wire. In fact, this is where I'll pause because I'm going to have to strip a bit of wire to actually wrap around this. Give me one moment, please. Okay, that's me. Improvised an outer connection in the form of a piece of copper wire, tin copper wire, wrapped around the outside and stuck on with sticky tape. I'd like to mention that if there's MD from the health and safety executive watching who's concerned about the fact that I've basically cobbled something together that is open and operates at 3,000 volts, then it's okay, I do have beer. Hold on one moment. Mm. Right, let's commence the experiment. What I'm expecting here is either just a dull purple glow, which I may have to take the exposure off the, off the camera to actually see it, or maybe the glow of a gas discharge. I'm not really sure. We'll find out when we power up. This could get spicy. Are you ready? Okay, let's take the exposure off and see what we can smell. I can see the ozone. Oh, you know what? I'm seeing... Did you see that spark at the end there? Watch I'll see if I can make it do it. Oh, I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure, right? Tell you what, the light is coming back. Shield your eyes. I could see a faint purple corona discharge around that. I don't know if you saw that. Um, it may have been too bright to see that. I could see the purple corona discharge following this wire, but I didn't see any obvious gas discharge. What I did see was a spark jumping inside up to the end of this tube. Okay, right, the soldier iron, which I turned off. I shouldn't have turned it off because now I want to disassemble that and see if the end of the tube is just sealed if it's got a if it's got a gas in it i don't see any obvious gas though or if it's just an open end to the tube going down to that so uh i'll let the soldier iron come back up to temperature i should not have turned that off let uh, lay, uh let's let's let it warm back up again that would be a good idea i shall take the sticky tape off that's a probably a good idea it was quite parpy and buzzy that's a very, very bit spiky bit of power coming out of that. It's not got the smoothness. Oh, hold on, hold on. Uh, look at that exposure. That is terrible. I am so sorry for the yo-yo exposure. Um, the power supply is very spiky. I get the feeling it is a capacitor being discharged through a coil. It's a, It's been done to make it cheap. Uh, with a neon type transformer I would expect maybe something like a Roy or oscillator where it's push pull better quality I'm not really sure what would happen if I connected that one to that I, I don't want to damage that neon supply is the question <clears throat> no I don't want to I don't want to wreck that so I won't there's too much risk that some electronic power supplies do not like being put across spiky jabby loads they prefer just a smooth neon tube although it's smooth there's no such thing as smooth neon tube electrically they're all quite spicy righty ho let's melt this and see if i can extract the tube from here the tube is sealed 
This has been made with standard lamp making practices. That is very odd. Let's take a closer look at this. It's quite good, actually. So the tuba has a, an, a, an electrode sealed into the end here. I doubt they've pulled a... They may have pulled a vacuum and actually put a gas in, but I don't think so. I think they've purely used it as a sealed glass tube, so the only other electrode here is right down at the end. And it looks as though they've just twisted. They've got a loop. Um, they've made a scroll, a sort of wrapped round sleeve of the stainless steel mesh in here. And they've looped that bit of wire around it and then twisted it just to make a connection. And that's the bit that has then been pulled through this seal at the end. And it does have that slight redness that it may be um, that particular type of wire, which the name I've forgotten of that wire because I... Um, Dume wire? Dumet wire, is it? Um, and that will have uh, that mates onto the glass better. So that's not what I was expecting. It also means this tube can theoretically now be reassembled, although I have to say that is a very ferocious power supply. I bet that generates a lot of electrical noise. That may be why they've got what appears to be possibly a commode suppression choke and input to try and tame that down. Um, but there we go. That is ultimately it. We have the inner conductor, we have the layer of glass to insulate it, we have the outer conductor, and then there'll be a space between them, which will be emulated by this. It's not a big space. It's about three millimetres between them. Maybe a bit more. Maybe four millimetres. And that corona will appear between this inner mesh via the glass and this outer uh, tube. So if you were to look down the end of this tube when it was actually powered, you'd see a purple glow down the inside. And uh, the air is passing through that and that's what split, splits the uh, molecules of oxygen apart into separate atoms of oxygen that then combine uh, as separate as, as possible clusters of three or individual ozone molecules. While we're on the subject of those ozone molecules, the science behind the reduction of odour with the ozone mo molecules is suppose you've got a suppose you've got a, a virus because it can actually do that let's no let's draw it as the current trend for a virus right so the virus is, with this wee sort of things out like that uh, the a free atom of oxygen or the ozone will touch that and because the ozone is unstable, it wants to revert back to its stable state, which is two, two of oxygen. It imparts an atom of oxygen onto that, and that oxidizes whatever it touches. That's why it smells like bleach when uh, you have that ozone in the air. And that uh, basically it's a, a gaseous bleach that is basically oxidizing everything it touches. And some materials are more susceptible than others. It's particularly bad to rubber. Um, it can cause a very rapid degradation of rubber bands and uh, tires and things like that. Um, but it does get rid of uh, organic smells because it oxidizes them and uh, other impurities in the airs, and it gives a natural freshness. It's worth mentioning at this time that there is an ambient level in nature of ozone in the air. And uh, I was looking at a product recently that produces trace levels of ozone. It claims it doesn't, but it does. And uh, I wonder if, uh, because there's an acceptable level of ozone, I wonder if, because houses uh, don't have a lot of ozone in them because it would be absorbed into all the uh, materials in the house and there's no really source to make it naturally in a house, I wonder if it's actually advantageous having a very low-level trickle of ozone stirred into the air of a house just to match the outside levels, the ambient levels, and just have that cleaning, sterilising, oxidising effect. Certainly, I've seen other devices that are aimed at the food industry that they just put out a very low level of ozone into the air. And they tend to be based on the ultraviolet tubes, uh, the UVC tubes, but shielded in an enclosure with a fan blowing the air across it. And the, the uh, ultraviolet radiation it is also quite high energy and it breaks the oxygen apart too, usually around about the 184 nanometer mark. Um, but there we go. That was interesting. It was well worth taking to bits and it's nice and reassuring to see it can be put together again. Although I really do not like that power supply. I think that's rather rather an aggressive and cheap and tacky one, to be honest. I think they've just done it the cheapest, simplest way they could. But it was certainly worth taking apart. Very interesting.